All right, my dudes, today we're gonna talk about birth control. Generally speaking, men are totally fine with blood, right? So like if you talk to most dudes, like we're totally cool watching a scary movie where some, you know, monster is tearing people apart. Or we're totally fine playing video games where there's like blood and gore and guts and like finishing moves and Mortal Kombat or like whatever. So we're totally fine with that unless it's menstrual blood. And if it's menstrual blood, we're kind of like Denethor from Lord of the Rings. I don't know if y'all have seen that or remember that where it's suddenly it's like, flee, flee, flee for your lives. Like this dude has been sitting there fighting the armies of Sauron for like his entire life. And one thing happens and suddenly he drops everything and has to run away and goes completely crazy. That's what we're like when it comes to menstruation. Hey there, thanks for watching and I'm glad these videos have been helpful. A lot of times I'll read the comments and see people asking, well, what do I actually do about it? Which is a great question. And unfortunately, the resources out there haven't been that great, which is precisely why I started HG in the first place. HG coaches are trained on a curriculum that integrates my understanding of what motivates us, what paralyzes us, and most importantly, what leads to lasting behavioral change. If you're ready to take the next step, HG coaches can help you build the life that you want. They've helped people build careers, help people find relationships, build networks of friends, and even do things like discover their passions or pursue hobbies. So if this sounds like something that you'd be interested in, check out the link in the description below. So today we're going to talk a little bit about menstruation, female ovulatory cycles, which I know are not, I know it sounds kind of weird, but this is not like bizarre, esoteric knowledge that is reserved only for doctors and like pagan witches, right? Like this is, these are normal bodily functions that every human being should know about in the same way that women should understand like, okay, this is an erection. Not every time a dude gets an erection, does it mean he's aroused, right? There's all kinds of basic stuff about the opposite gender that we don't really know. So today we're going to teach all about that because it will help you a lot. Okay. So let's start by understanding the female menstrual cycle. So women have ovaries and men have testicles. These are both called gonads, okay? So gonads is the, the non-binary term for like the sex hormone producing part of our body. So women's ovaries are situated kind of outside of their uterus. So the, if you look at the, the anatomy of a woman, right? So there's a vagina and then there's a cervix. And then beyond the cervix, there's a uterus. And then the uterus has these two things called fallopian tubes. And then the fallopian tubes sit right next to these things called the ovaries, which are the female equivalent of testicles. In ovaries, you have a bunch of eggs. So basically what happens in the female menstrual cycle is we've got two phases. One is called the follicular phase, which is when an egg is developing or a follicle is developing. And then you've got something called the ovulatory phase, which is when the a woman enters ovulation, which if you don't even know what that is, we're going to explain that. So in the ovaries, there are these little things called follicles. And then the follicle kind of supports an egg. When women ovulate, what happens is the egg kind of spits out of the follicle and is prepared to be fertilized. So the menstrual cycle is usually divided into 28 days. And the first 14 days are the follicular phase, which is when we're sort of getting ready to be pregnant. And then once the egg is ready... We enter ovulation, which is when the follicle spits out the egg. And then there's a window of about three to five days leading up to ovulation and through ovulation where a woman can get pregnant. And if a woman is not pregnant during that time, or doesn't become pregnant, then what happens is they enter into the phase of menstruation. So let's talk a little bit about the female menstrual cycle. So we have to understand there are two things going on during the female menstrual cycle. The first is that we are preparing an egg, and by we, I mean women, for fertilization. And the second is we are preparing the uterus for a pregnancy. So these are two separate things, right? So if we've got a fertilized egg, it needs some place to hang out and grow into an embryo, a fetus, and eventually a child. So these are two things that are kind of going on. So we're going to first talk about egg preparation. So in the ovaries, we have these little guys called follicles. And for the first 14 days of the menstrual cycle, this is called the follicular phase, where these follicles are being prepared. And basically, the ovary selects one follicle, which has one egg. And then once that egg is kind of primed and ready, it spits the egg out. And then for a period of about 24 hours, that egg can be fertilized. 
if it gets fertilized in that time, then what happens is it implants into the wall of the uterus. And basically during the follicular phase, the, the walls of the uterus are growing. And growing in what way? They're sort of getting vascularized, which means that if there's a new human being that's going to be growing there or any animal, if it's going to be growing there, we need a, a lot of blood flow to the embryo. So during this 14 days that the egg is getting ready, the uterus is actually building up a bunch of tissue to prepare for pregnancy, okay? Now, if there is no fertilization of the egg or the egg doesn't implant, then the uterus is like, hey, we built up all this like vascular tissue. We don't need this anymore. And that then it induces menstruation. And what menstruation is, is we're shedding the, the wall, the lining of the walls of the uterus. So we built up all this vascular tissue that can literally sustain a new life. And now we don't need it anymore, so we're going to get rid of it. And that's what that menstrual blood is. So let's understand a couple of things first. The first is the average amount of volume in menstruation is about two tablespoons or 30 to 40 cc's. This is it. This is all the blood there is. I don't know why dudes get so scared. This is a small quantity of blood. This is not very much, right? But since it's menstrual blood, oh my God, let's get terrified. It's 30 to 40 cc's for the average woman. Second thing we have to understand is that there's really only a three to five day window where a woman can get pregnant if they have a normal menstrual cycle. So remember that after ovulation, so ovulation is when the follicle spits out the egg, there's a 24 hour window before the egg kind of falls apart maybe 36. But the key thing to remember, this is where nature tricks you, is that sperm can stay alive in the uterus for a couple days before that. So there's really only a three to five day window every month where if a woman has a normal menstrual cycle, she can get pregnant. And so as we talk about birth control, that's something that's really important to remember, okay? So just to summarize, menstrual cycles, first of all, are not scary. It's okay. It's a normal cycle. It has 14 days of the follicular phase. Then we spit the egg out. If the egg gets fertilized, implants into the uterus, and we're on to pregnancy. But if it doesn't implant in the uterus, there's some stuff that happens in over the course of the next 14 days. That's it kind of everything kind of winds down, and then we sort of end up with menstruation. Okay? So now let's talk a little bit about birth control. So what we're gonna do is review a lot of different types of birth control, sort of what the efficacy is and considerations for when you should use each one. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is we're going to define efficacy. So what do we mean by efficacy of birth control? So all of the studies on birth control look at people who are using a particular method for one year, and what is the chance they end up pregnant or not pregnant if you're using that method of birth control for one year. So for example, when people say condoms are 90% effective, what does that mean? That means that if people are having sex using condoms for the period of one year, 90% of them will not get pregnant. 10% of them will. It does not mean that a single usage of a condom means that there's a 10% chance you're not rolling the dice with a 10% chance that someone gets pregnant. And now it sort of makes sense because if we understand the menstrual cycle and women can only get pregnant three to five days out of the month if they have normal menstrual cycles, and then we're using a condom and sometimes condoms screw up, all that stuff has to align in order for someone to get pregnant, okay? So efficacy is using that birth control over the period of one year. What are the chances that it prevents pregnancy? So let's talk a, a minute about condoms. So condoms are special. They're very special and very unique from other levels of birth control for a couple of reasons. The first is that they're, generally speaking, one of the only methods of birth control that can prevent STIs. So this is really important because when we have sex, there are usually two things that we're trying to avoid. One is we're trying to avoid pregnancy, unless you're trying to get pregnant, which is totally cool. And we're trying to avoid the transmission of sexually transmitted diseases, okay? So the condom is really the only one that can prevent STIs. So if you are concerned about getting an STI or you're having sex with someone and you don't know what their sexual history is, you don't know what kind of you know partners they've had or, or how sexually they, they active they are with other people, it's probably a good idea to use a condom. So this is where even if you're on birth control as a woman, it may be a good idea to use a condom anyway if you're concerned at all about STIs. So let's talk for a second about STIs. Generally speaking, there are two kinds of STIs. There are viral infections and bacterial infections. So bacterial infections, thankfully, we can treat really, really well now. 
So there used to be old infections like syphilis like back in the day that would cause all kinds of problems. They can damage your spinal cord, get into your brain over time and cause all kinds of, you know, brain damage and stuff like that. But generally speaking, we can give people antibiotics to treat things like syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia. You take a course of antibiotics and you're actually like cured of the STI, which is why it's really, really important that if something is happening with your junk, whether you're a dude or a woman or something in between, if you've got like a sore or something nasty down there or a vesicle or a rash, you need to go see a doctor right away. And why is that? Well, because a lot of times when something goes wrong with your body, especially if it's your junk, you don't want to show anyone. You're just going to cross your fingers and hope it goes away. And this is the thing. Your immune system's pretty good. So after a week, it may go away. Like it may actually do that because our immune system's pretty good. The problem is that a lot of these infections can be dormant for some amount of time and then can cause damage long term. So if you ever see something going on with your junk, you should absolutely go see a doctor, okay? Second kind of infection you can get is called a viral infection. So the viral infections are a little bit trickier because we don't have great treatments that will eradicate them. So good examples of viral infections are HIV, which is essentially a lifelong diagnosis. Things like herpes virus is another very common viral infection, which somewhere between, by the way, 25 and 40% of the population has, okay? So herpes will kind of stick with you basically lifelong. The good news is that even with viral infections, um, we're pretty good at treating them. So for uh, herpes, for example, the severity and frequency of outbreaks tends to go down over time. Most people actually, not most, but you know, 25 to 40% of people have it, and, and it's not like ruining lives right, left, and center. The other thing is HIV now has a normal life expectancy. We've got really good treatments for HIV now. There's also something that's really important to understand is if you are having sex with someone and it's kind of a high risk situation, the condom breaks or you don't use a condom, even if you've had sex, we now have something called post-exposure prophylaxis, which means if you have sex with someone without a condom who may be HIV positive, you can actually start taking retroviral medication after the sex, like 24 hours later, and it can actually prevent HIV infection. So if you're concerned at all about viral infections, you should absolutely once again go see a doctor, okay? The third thing that we're going to add, which is a little bit of a caveat, is not everything going on with your junk is a sexually transmitted infection. So I've seen some relationships get really, really messed up through this. But let's say someone ends up with a rash, their partner ends up with a rash, everyone assumes it's sexually transmitted, but there are all kinds of other infections that aren't transmitted via sex that can happen to your junk. So one example is if the pH in the vagina changes, you can start to get fungal infections in there. There are some medications that will induce, you know, uh, fungal infections with penises or vaginas or things like that. So not everything that is, not all infections of the junk is necessarily sexually transmitted. Bacterial vaginosis is another good example of that, okay? So you can still get it treated, right? So it's, it, you should absolutely get it treated, but it, just because you have an infection of your junk doesn't mean that you necessarily got it from a partner. That's why you should once again, go do what? See a doctor, very good, okay? So that's condoms. From a birth control standpoint, condoms are about 90% effective. So if you don't wanna use condoms, now we kind of move into predominantly female methods of birth control. So the most common female method of birth control is probably the pill, okay? So how does the pill work? Remember, now that y'all understood the female menstrual cycle, so remember that the follicle grows and then spits out the egg. So how does female birth control work? Female birth control works by altering hormones so that we pre prevent that ovulation and follicular development, okay? Depending on what kind of birth control you use, things can be a little bit different about what part of the cycle it targets. But essentially, if there's never an egg that gets ovulated out, no one can ever get pregnant. So what we can do is add levels of estrogen and progesterone, which you kind of take on a regular basis. And depending on what combination you take, it'll sort of prevent a different part of that menstrual cycle. This is where it's important to remember that different kinds of birth control can be right for different sorts of people. So this is where it's also important for dudes to understand that even though you're taking a pill every day, a lot of these birth controls can be very unpleasant. So you're taking hormones like estrogen and progesterone, which can lead to things like more minor stuff, which can be very not minor, by the way, like bloating or cramps, which are very unpleasant. And they can birth control can even do things like cause strokes and blood clots. So also PSA, if you're on birth control and smoking, you should really not be on that combination and talk to a doctor about it. 
drastically increases your risk of stroke and blood clots. So birth control, there are a couple of different kinds. If a particular kind of birth control is not working, um, you know, you can try to take a different formulation that has different hormonal balances. Generally speaking, uh, oral contraceptive pills are somewhere between 95 and 98 percent effective. And why is that? So why aren't they 100 percent effective or 99 percent effective? It's because oftentimes human beings will forget to take pills. So there's a certain amount of human error. But basically somewhere between 2 and 5 percent of people who are on oral contraceptive pills can end up pregnant. So moving on beyond oral contraceptive pills, the next thing, um, which I, I think is a really fantastic form of birth control, is something called an IUD. So an IUD is an intrauterine device. So remember that the egg gets spit, spit out, gets fertilized by a sperm, and then that embryo has to implant into the wall of the uterus to create pregnancy. So what an intrauterine device is, is it's something that is implanted into the uterus, through the vagina, through the cervix, and into the uterus. So it usually doesn't interfere with sex because sex is in the vagina, okay? What it essentially does is creates a minor inflammatory environment, or it releases a local hormone like progesterone, which is just affects the uterus, that prevents pregnancy. So the cool thing about intrauterine devices is even though we can use hormonal contraception— there aren't systemic effects. You won't end up with bl uh, bloating or cramping or headaches or other kinds of problems because if, instead of hormones flooding all through your body because you're taking a pill, right? And when I take a pill, it goes to my stomach, distributes all through my body. There's a localized effect in the uterus that will prevent pregnancy. So the cool thing about IUDs is they tend to be 99% effective. Um, and basically, they, you know, it's very hard to get pregnant on an IUD because they're very well designed. And why is it, quote unquote, superior to oral contraceptive pills? It's because you don't have to worry about remembering to take your medication every day. You can leave an IUD in the uterus for five years or even longer. So it's like a you know one-time thing that you can kind of do if you're not planning on getting pregnant anytime soon. You can get it changed out every five years. And so it's kind of like a good solution if you're pretty sure you're not going to be pregnant anytime soon or don't want to be pregnant. So there are a couple of other methods to deliver hormones and essentially and have the same effect as oral contraceptive pills. So there are hormonal, there are birth control patches. So this is something that you slap on maybe once a month, right? So instead of taking a pill every day, you can just slap on a patch. Um, and, and they work similar to oral contraceptive pills. It's hormonal in nature. There are also shots that you can get either monthly or every three months that will also prevent pregnancy. You get a shot, sort of does something to your hormone levels. And there are even things called impl uh, there are implants where people can, you know, put a, a like a little implant subdermally, so right under the skin that slowly trickles out hormone hormones that will prevent pregnancy. All three of these things tend to be comparably effective. We're probably talking about somewhere around 98% efficacy. And then there's the last form of birth control, which also tends to be somewhat drastic or permanent which is that you can get a vasectomy if you're a dude, right? So if you're 100% sure that you're done having kids, you can get a vasectomy. And what is a vasectomy? So we have our testicles, and then we have our penis, right? So what happens is our penis is where the ejaculate comes from, and the testicles is where the sperm comes from. So somehow the sperm has to get from the testicles to the penis. And it usually does that through these, these tubes called the vas deferens. And if we snip those tubes, what happens is the sperm can never get to the actual semen. And so you're shooting blanks. So this is usually close to 100% effective. Some people will talk about vasectomy reversals. Just FYI, vasectomy reversals are not very effective. So I think there's something like 60% effective if you do them within a year or two. So if you wait a couple of years after getting a vasectomy, you may not be able to have kids naturally, okay? So it's sort of a permanent birth control solution. It's a surgical option for men. For women, there are a couple of different things that you can do. One is, in the most drastic cases, some women will have hysterectomies. Usually they have hysterectomy, which is removal of the uterus, by the way, um, usually for medical reasons. So if someone's got like uterine cancer or something like that, you can just remove the whole uterus. The other thing that you can do is remember that there are the ovaries and there's the fallopian tubes and the egg travels down the fallopian tube into the uterus. You can get your tubes tied, um, which is when you sort of sever or tie those fallopian tubes so that the egg can never reach the uterus and can never get fertilized. That's another surgical option for women. 
So these are drastic that are basically kind of 100% permanent sort of things, um, uh, methods of birth control. So hopefully at this point, I know I've tossed a lot of information at y'all, but I do think it's really important for men to understand female birth control. And why is that? It's because most of the options are actually like available to women, right? And we as men need to, first of all, not be afraid of the period. It's not a terrifying thing. And, you know, women have them every month and it's not, it doesn't invoke Satan or anything like that. It's just women have periods. It's a normal part of their physiology. We should also understand as men like a little bit about things like STIs and stuff like that. And by the way, if you're a woman and you didn't understand this stuff because you grew up in a household where people didn't want to teach you about birth control, fantastic, right? So that's great too. So remember that condoms are really the only effective protection against STIs. There are some female condom equivalents, which basically don't get used very much, but condoms are about 90% effective. I think uh, IUDs tend to work really, really well if you don't want to get pregnant for a long period of time. If you are on a hormonal-based birth control, as a dude, you need to understand that those don't come without side effects. So oftentimes, the reason that women are reluctant to take birth control is because it makes them feel like crap. And so that's something that is a long-term conversation, hopefully, between you and your partner about condom use and other things like that. And most of all, I want all y'all, man, woman, everything in between, to stay safe and don't get pregnant unless you want to get pregnant. So if you've got a uterus or ovaries, I don't care what you identify as, if you've got a uterus and ovaries and you're menstru uh, if you're ovulating, then you can get pregnant, right? So just remember that. So everyone should act accordingly, and hopefully this information has helped y'all to stay sexually safe sexually healthy, and not wind up with unnecessary pregnancies.